right, I guess we're going to start again. How many of you are happy to be able to start again? God is good, right? Now, look, we're going to sing our theme song, um, Marching Design, number 422. Isaac Watts, a small man but high wattage. This guy changed the world um, with his hymns. I like to sing right out of the hymn book. How about you? The reason is because you use your frontal lobe a little more when you're singing the different parts. How many want your frontal lobe to be uh, on top performance? Excellent. So don't just sing your normal part, you know. I'm going to have to do that because I'm up front. But you guys sing different parts, okay, and switch it up so you wake up. This will help you wake up, by the way, this afternoon. Let's sing together. Come we that love the Lord. Come we that love the Lord and let our joys be known. Join in the song with sweet accord. Join in the song with sweet accord. Thus around the throne and thus around. Are we marching? We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. We're marching upward to Zion. Let the beautiful city of God. Last verse. Then pray together. Father in heaven, we're thankful today that there is a place called Zion, and there is a way to get there as we follow your footsteps. We want to be mighty men of God following you, our leader, and we thank you. We come in Christ's name. Amen. Please be seated. We're still going to sing. How many want to sing a little more? Um, number 251. Number 251 in your hymn books. They'll catch up with the words. We're going to sing number 251, He Lives. Now, this is an interesting song. There was a, uh, there was a man who was, uh, that wrote this song. He was talking to an uh, individual who was of the Jewish faith, and he said to him, why would I follow a dead Jew? He says, well, here's the deal. He did die, but he lives. And he began to prove that to that young man, and he began to listen to him, and uh, then he was listening to the radio the next day, and a guy got it. it was on the, on the weekend where they were celebrating the resurrection of Christ, right? And this guy was saying, very uh, liberal pastor, was saying, you know what, whether he lived or died doesn't matter to me, just so long as his truth goes marching on. He got so upset, he said, wait a minute, that is not what the Bible teaches. He lives. And his wife said, well, why don't you do something about this? You know how these wives get the men to be really men? Right? How many of you are a better man because of the women in your life? And he says, why don't you write about it? Why don't you write? And he, so he wrote this song, He Lives, okay? So we're going to sing it together. And we, you can't sing this tame. No, can't do that. Number 251. Now watch me, because I might actually hold out a few notes a little longer, okay? Don't just go on your own. Don't go rogue here. We're going to work together. All right, let's try it together. Let's sing together. I serve a risen Savior, He's in the world today. I know that He is living, whatever man may say. I see His hand of mercy, I hear His voice of cheer. And just the time I need Him, He's always near. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along the narrow way. Does he live? He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. Where does he live? He loving 
care. And though my heart grows weary, I never will despair. I know that he is leading through all the we bless. The day of his appearing will come at last. Let's hear you. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives. Salvation to Rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing eternal hallelujah to Jesus Christ the King, the hope of all who seek him, the help of all who find. None other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, does he live? He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he, let's hear it. He person next to you, if you're happy they live, say, I'm glad you're alive. I don't see it. All right. Hallelujah. I see some of you didn't have anyone turn to you, and so I turned to you. I'm glad you're alive today. You know, there was a story told in communist country. They were talking about how God in uh, Christianity is something to not be followed. And finally, they gave the token religious person there a chance to stand up and say something. And guess what he said? The Lord is risen. He's risen indeed. And the crowd went wild after they'd listened to three hours of the communists. They just knew that Jesus lives. Amen? Amen. All right. Sunshine in my soul. How many want some sunshine in your soul today? We're going to sing that next. There's sunshine in my soul. And those are doing the, uh, the graphics. You know, I love watching Henderson play the piano on the back uh, monitor here, but it would be wonderful to have the words there as well. Um, there is sunshine in my soul today. Now, this is an interesting song. There was a, a lady who was injured. I can't remember how she got injured, but she was so injured she had to put in a, be put in a complete body cast. I mean, she could not move. And for I don't know how long she was in that cast, but, you know, it was probably months. I'm not sure exactly how long. Finally, she was released from the body cast. And guess what she wrote? She wrote this song. There is sunshine in my soul today. She was so happy. So let's, uh, let's sing it together. There is sunshine in my soul today. I'll cheer you. There is sunshine in my soul today. More glorious and bright than glows in any earthly sky. Lord Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling. There is sunshine in my soul. There is music in my soul today. A carol to my King. And Jesus listening can hear the songs I cannot sing. Let's hear you. Oh. Peace. 
graceful happy moments roll when jesus shows his smiling face there is sunshine in my soul this last verse hey man is it appropriate for men to smile at each other i don't think it's appropriate i mean why don't you smile at that guy next to you this time now this is going to really kick it up a notch just take some real I mean, it's hard enough to smile maybe at your wife, but smile at the guy next to you, okay? Let's try it. And let's just have some real joy, gladness in my soul today, okay? Let's try it together. Look at that guy next to you when we get to the chorus, when we're singing, oh, okay. <laughs> I know you're not going to do it, but I'm going to try it. Let's try it. <laughs> there is gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love. For blessings which he gives me now, and for what? For joys laid up above. Okay, look at that person and smile. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine. The peaceful, happy moments grow when Jesus shows his smiling face. There is sunshine in my soul how many just feel happier right now you know why that music just has that that sense of bringing uh those happy neurochemicals out in your brain Amen. we've got some uh special numbers now how many of you enjoyed the piano this weekend Amen. so we're going to hear more of that right now henderson pontel is going to be playing the heavens are telling
Is that a blessing? Amen. The heavens are telling. Well, I want to tell you something here as well. Those of you in the back, please move forward. We need more people up front. How many of you can actually stand up? Let's all stand up, see if that works. And then once you're standing up, please come forward and just fill in the seats here in the front, and uh, that will help us have this nice, warm, cozy feeling as we're listening to our next number. And uh, yes, come on in. Come on in. I see some of you still in the back. We have plenty of room for you. Move in. Press together, saints. Um, greet that person next to you. Okay, you can have a seat. And Jordan Fode is going to come and bless us now with another special number, a mighty fortress. I believe God calls us to stand up for the truth in the face of evil. And I believe we need to stand up for Jesus. A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. For still our ancient foe doth seek to work us woe. His craft and power are great, and armed with cruel hate. On earth is not his equal. Did we in our own strength confide, our striving would be losing. Were not that right man on our side, the man of God's own choosing? Doth ask who that may be, Christ Jesus, it is he, Lord Sabaoth, his name, from age to age the same. And he must win the battle. And though this world with devils filled should strive and to undo us, but we will not fear, for God has willed his strength to triumph through us. The prince of darkness grim, we tremble not for him. His rage we can endure. For lo, his doom is sure. One little word shall fell him. That word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. The body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever, his kingdom is forever and ever. Amen. A mighty fortress. Well, let's sing one last song. Rejoice ye pure in heart. How many of you want to be pure in heart? Number 27 in your hymn books. And we're going to sing two verses of this. We'll sing the first verse and the last verse. And then we'll be going into our question and answer period with Pastor Ross and Pastor Bachelor. Rejoice. Let's stand together as we sing this. We can't sit singing this song. Rejoice ye pure in heart, rejoice, give thanks and sing, your vessel banner wave on high, the cross of Christ your King. Rejoice, 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 give thanks and sing. Let's sing the third verse. With all the angel choirs, with all the saints on earth, pour out the strains of joy and bliss to rapture no blister. Rejoice, rejoice, rejoice in him. Last verse. Praise him.
Amen. Thank you, Don. It sounded beautiful backstage. You have a group of men singing enthusiastically. Oh, there's nothing like it. Well, again, we want to welcome you to this special program, Mighty Men of God. And we do have some questions that came in, Pastor Doug. So we're going to take the next 15, 20 minutes and try and answer as many of these questions as we can. All right. How is everybody? Great. You had a good lunch? You awake? Yeah. Check and see if the guy next to you is awake. <laughs> so you awake? All right. Got that settled. All right. Okay, the first question that we have, the important question, how do we resist temptation? Well, you know, I wrote a little book called 12 Tips to Resisting Temptation, and I can't go through all 12 of them with you right now. But um, one of the most important things you can do is recognize the areas where you are tempted and avoid a rendezvous at those places. Mm -hmm. Try to avoid those places in your thinking, um, whether it's, uh, you know, if you're an alcoholic, don't push your cart back and forth through the liquor section of the grocery store. Uh, you want to avoid the areas of tem temptation. If there's a person flirting with you and you're married, avoid them. We'll talk more about that in the presentation later. But um, strengthen your faith. The Word of God is how Jesus met temptation. Every temptation, uh, Jesus said, it is written. And then you fortify yourself with prayer. But uh, there's a number of strategic things you can do, and uh, you might want to take a look at that book. You can read it for free online. It's called Tips for Resisting Temptation. All right, the next question that we have is, um, are there any biblical tips for a person struggling with a hot temper? You know, they say that uh, the more shallow the pot, the quicker the water boils. You will increase your perceived IQ if you don't fly into uh, a temper tantrum uh, quickly. Uh, a soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up strife. I was visiting with my neighbor this week, and he was stunned because he just talked to another neighbor in the neighborhood and said, you know, if you could please try to keep your pit bull on a leash or in your yard, but you really shouldn't have him. Boy, as soon as he said that, the neighbor just flew off the handle, went into a rage, and... Uh, Soft words turn away wrath. Grievous words stir, stir up strife. And so uh, you can help avoid someone else losing their temper often by just dealing gently with people. Um, a man who can control his spirit is stronger than one who captures a city. You know, Mike Tyson lost his temper and bit off a piece of Holifield, of Andrew Holifield's ear, and he lost $300 million worth of fights because of that. That's an expensive temper. And so people have lost a lot more. I can tell you a number of stories. You got some in the Bible where people went and flew into a rage and made terrible decisions. And so just pray that God will give you rule over your spirit. All right, we have another question. It says, what is the best system that you have found for personal devotions? All right, very good question, practical question. And uh, one of the keys for being a mighty man of God is the personal devotions. We're going to talk in a little bit about the armor of God. What does that represent? The sword, the Word of God. You have several scriptures. The Word of God, chapter 4 of Hebrews, is quick and sharp and more powerful than any two-edged sword. And the Bible tells us in Ephesians 6, the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And in Revelation, Jesus is pictured coming with a sword coming out of His mouth, meaning the words of Christ are like a sword. And so uh, this is one of the most important ways for us to um, resist temptation in your devotional life. The um, Bible says, give us this day our daily bread. It's not just talking in the Lord's Prayer about eating food every day, but for the believer, the Word of God, daily devotions would, should be just as important. And you'd be surprised, a little bit can go a long way. You don't have to read 10 chapters of the Bible Sometimes you get low blood sugar. All you need is a granola bar and you're good to go for a while. And so read a few verses if you don't have a lot of time every day, but have a regular plan going through the Bible. Now some people, I think Martin Luther is one who said, you can read the Bible the way you pick apples. First you shake the whole tree and see what falls. Because apples drop when they're ripe. And then you shake the branches and then you shake the, um, the limbs and then you go behind every leaf. First, get the overview of the Bible, the story of the Bible. Shake the tree. And then you might want to take um, a different book, study a book of the Bible, compare it to other books. There's so many great Bible study tools now online with computers that 
uh, it's actually been spoiling me because I can find things so quickly now. I used to have to go back and forth through the Bible to find a verse. Or I used to use those old big, any of you remember the big concordances, big Young's analytical exhaustive concordance. And you'd search through the word the 6,000 times. It's in there, you know, the. Find all the references. And, um, but now with computers, you can really search very quickly. Um, I read my Bible every day on a computer. Uh, part of my Bible reading, I'm always, I use a computer program. There's free ones online like eSword. And it has a regular Bible reading program. So I'm always reading through the Bible every day except Sabbath because I'm touching up my sermon. You know, the manna fell six days a week, but none fell on the seventh day. So I, that's my excuse anyway. But um, you can study a topic in the Bible. You want to know faith. Take the word faith. Go through all the studies on faith. It can take you all the way from beginning to end. You can talk about the Spirit. Do a study on the Spirit. That's topical. You can do a character studies in the Bible. Learn a lot about people. And so there's just some ideas. Get into a Bible study group. Matter of fact, our church here, we're just launching a bunch of small groups and several of them are studying different realms of, of uh, Scripture. And so there's just some ideas. And there's some great uh, Bible study outlines you can also find online. All right, the next question is, is it wrong to own a gun to defend your family? Okay, you know, this is in the news a lot uh, lately. People are all talking about gun control. Now, what I'm sharing, I am saying by permission and not by commandment. This does not represent the official position of my church or anybody but me. But for me, I've always believed that a gun is a tool. That... Um, Granted, it is a very powerful tool, but it is a tool. People be, can be killed with screwdrivers and knives. A terrorist just slashed a bunch of people and killed them in, um, oh, I forget, it was overseas somewhere, with a knife. Um, I think people need to be very careful. If you are a man and you have a firearm, you want to make sure that it is not loaded in near children because it is a powerful tool. But we live up in the country. We've got a place up there, and we quite literally have lions and tigers and bears. I don't have tigers. We've got skunks and rattlesnakes. And I mean, and so if you live on a ranch, people don't ever ask this question out in the country. But um, there's nothing in the Bible, I believe, that says there's anything wrong with a person defending their family. The idea of turning the other cheek if someone smites you doesn't mean that you need to allow a home invasion. You know what I'm saying? If you're a man... A matter of fact, even jo Jesus talks about in a parable, a strong man defends his house. If you want to take the strong man's house, you must bind the man. Why? Because otherwise he won't let you ransack his house. And so it, it's, you know, a pretty practical understanding that if somebody's trying to invade your home and there's a criminal, first thing I'd do is if I had a firearm, I'd try and fire it into the air and scare him off. I'd use it in a defensive way. And then you wouldn't want to use it lethally until a very last resort, but uh, I, I think that uh, that's just practical knowledge. Now, if you're uncomfortable with that, that's like I said, that's, you're asking me what I think. All right. The next question is, how do I show support for my spouse if she is unwilling to support me? <laughs> well, aren't we glad that God supports us even when we don't support Him. And aren't you thankful the Lord protects you and remembers you even when we forget about Him? Yeah, aren't, isn't that a good thing? And so uh, I think it's, um, uh, we need to be loving and supporting, you know, give and it will be given unto you. Sometimes you've got to be the first one to take the initiative to be loving, to be supportive, to give. And uh, yes, even if your spouse you don't feel like is supporting, you don't overcome evil with evil, you don't retaliate, you don't play the silent game, you um, overcome evil with good. You be loving, you be considerate. And you know, one of the hardest things, uh, maybe even a little harder for men than women, is when there is a dispute in a marriage to take the initiative and say, let's talk, I'm sorry. And sometimes you need to learn to say you're sorry even though you may not believe you're totally wrong about whatever the issue is. It's not unethical. You're not lying. You can mean I'm sorry we've had a disagreement. But if you take the initiative and you humble your heart and you say you're willing to talk, you'll often find the other party will say, well, I'm sorry too. And so it's good to take the first step and say, let's make peace. All right, we have another question that's come in. It says, how do I balance work and family time. 
Well, you might be asking the wrong person. <laughs> Because I still struggle with that all the time. We're all in this together, amen? amen? You know, men are task-oriented. You know, in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam. He made Adam. He said, I made this world. It's wild. It's beautiful, perfect, but it's wild. God planted a garden. Everything else was ungardened. And He said, go forth, subdue, conquer the world. And the world was a big, a big adventure to Adam. And, uh, you know, men are created wanting to conquer something to take on an adventure, to do something great. And we are very task, work oriented. And so problem is sometimes, especially if we're having problems in our relationships, we want to feel fulfilled. We say, well look, I can't control things in the relationship and I'm having trouble communicating at home, so I'm going to compensate by trying to be successful in my work. There's an old Jewish adage, if you're lucky in work, you're not lucky at, in love. And um, it's often because people are working so hard that they're neglecting the personal relationship. It is a constant, ongoing effort that a person needs to make to spend time with your family, to spend time with your spouse. And you know, probably one of the best things is you need to look at your calendar, carve out time in advance. You know, I really respect Mark Finley. He was uh, talking to me one time. He said, how do you deal with the pressures of doing, you know, evangelism and you speaking appointments and uh, you, here we get the church as well and he said, as I'm planning my year, first thing I do is I look at the calendar and I say, what are the vacations? When are the graduations? When are the family events and the holidays? He said, I circle those first. So you get them out of the way first and he said, then you can fill things in with work and then you leave a little spare time for emergencies that could go either way, uh, whether it's a family or work but uh, I said, first you got to block out, you know that old adage, if you want to fill a, bo a bucket with uh, rocks and gravel and everything, you got to put the big rocks in first. And so carve out that time in advance, plan it in advance, and you'll preserve it. All right, here's a practical question. How old is too old to spank your kids? <laughs> your kids shouldn't spank you once you're about 30. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good a practical question. Um, you know, some countries it's illegal now. And you watch, just give it a little time, it'll start being illegal in North America. Probably is in some places right now. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever remember a book written by James Dobson. It really is the book that made him popular. It was called Dare to Discipline. And he talked about the balance, and I think the book is still for sale, of how to love your children and guide them. And there was even a time for uh, measured corporal punishment. If you have a young child and they don't understand the principle of standing, sticking a metal object in the outlet and you say no and they continue to do it, at some point you'd want to swat their hand and you make um, an association between pain. When I stick the screwdriver in the outlet or the paper clip, I feel pain. Don't do that. Uh, if they're walking, if they keep riding their little tricycle out into the street and you say do not go out in the street, I tell them do not. You can't just tell them to have quiet time if you want to save their life, you might have to uh, paddle them on that place that God has prepared. Uh, but at some point, they get a little older and you communicate with them, then, um, and you know what that age is, it's probably a little later for boys than girls. You know, girls have tender hearts and often you just, you raise your voice and they melt. They start to cry. And that just, you know, admonishing them is all it takes. Boys sometimes can be a little more strong-willed and so it might be a little later. What that age is, I don't know. I'm just guessing. I'm not an expert. Seven, eight. What do you think? Huh? Yeah. Somewhere in there. See, we're all in this together. I don't have all the answers. <laughs> what do you think, Pastor Ross? I don't know. We're You're still spanking yours, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to find out when I was supposed to stop, but anyway. We <laughs> all right, next question is, I work so hard during the week, is it okay from time to time to stay home to rest on Sabbath? Well, you, you, and I understand, you know, there's some people that are just working six days a week and then they, f they wake up and they're, oh man, I've got to get up and get dressed again. They might not even have to get dressed for work or dressed up. And, um, but will God understand if I just sleep this one through? You know, there may be exceptions where you are physically, you really are exhausted. But it's, uh, you, something's got to give, you got to do something about your work because if you don't have time for your worship, then your work has become too important. 
and you're setting an example for your family that work is not optional, but worship is. And so uh, it's, you know, if you've got a car, men, if you've got a car and it only starts three out of four times, would you work on the spark plugs or timing or something? If every time you turn the key, it, it started, but with that fourth time, it wouldn't start, you'd say something's wrong with the car. And if a person is only making it to church three out of four times a month, there might be a problem in the relationship. Going to church is not really just an option. You know, it actually says in the Bible, Sabbath is called a holy convocation. That means a holy, an assem holy assembly. Uh, we're called together. Uh, Paul said, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together the, as the manner of some is, and all the more as you see the day approaching. So as we near the end of time, we need meetings like this where we come together and we gather strength. And I have a friend that uh, has told me several times, you know, Doug, I was so tired. I work all week long and I was just, I, this was the week I was going to stay home. I said, oh, I'm just too tired. I'm not going to go. And I almost didn't come. But a little voice told me to come. He said, boy, did I ever need what I heard today. And it seems like the days the devil's going to tell you to stay home are the days he's afraid you're going to go to church because you're going to get just what you need. And so you'll never know what you missed if you miss it. All right, the next question that we have is a little more of a serious question. It says, I, I once was unfaithful to my wife, but she won't let it go. She brings it up from time to time. What do I do? Yeah, that is serious. And of course, you know, that could work both ways. And um, I'm happy to hear that even though there was a case of infidelity, it did not end the marriage. Often people say, well, that's it, and they throw in the towel. So it's good that the person is willing to stay and try and work things out. Uh, and so that's a good sign. Um, what I would do is I would appeal to my spouse and say, what are your expectations for me to regain your trust? Is it ever going to be possible? Um, do our, everything you can, and don't expect there not to be consequences. So if it has damaged trust and if it has damaged the relationship, you earned it. There's going to be consequences. Accept that and then do your very best to try to prove that you still love them and that you are a new person, a new creature, and to do everything you can to uh, regain that confidence. And so, you know, people sort of come to the table in relationships with a certain amount of trust that can be added to or taken away from. If you violate trust, you've heard the expression about hell hath no fury like a woman, a woman scorned. If you violate that trust, it takes a long time to win it back, but it can be done. I've seen it done. And you just have to be patient, pray, and you have to overcompensate with love. All right, the next question that we have is, what is the relationship between faith and works for the Christian? Well, of course, we are saved. You want to be careful not to leave a person with the impression that we are saved by works. But if we are saved by faith, which we are, it'll be seen in works. Um, it's like James, and James and Paul almost sound like opposites, but they're talking to different groups. Paul is talking to legalists that think they're working their way to heaven, and he emphasizes faith. James is talking to people that are talking about faith, and they don't think that their actions mean anything because, alas, we believe. And so he starts to emphasize the importance of having practical Christian works. Uh, really, both should be in the life. The Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith for works. And so works is not a dirty word. Works means your actions. And so there should be actions. I remember C.D. Brooks, who passed away this last year, used to tell an illustration about this man who struggled with drinking and, and his wife was uh, getting exasperated. He'd come home drunk and she got tired and she'd lock him out and then he'd stand downstairs and he'd billow up to the second store and say, honey, let me in. I'm sorry. I'm late. Waking up the whole neighborhood. I, and then he'd say, I love you. Let me three words. I love you. And she'd get tired and open the door. This happened often. And she kept relenting when he'd start to be out there howling. Three little words. I love you. And then one time she just got so tired of it and she, he said, three little words. I love you. He's staggering outside drunk. And she opened the door, she says, I have two words for you, prove it. And then shut the window. So if you love, you, sh you demonstrate that love. Uh, we shouldn't be loving in word only. Jesus talked about those who draw near with their mouth, but their heart is far. It's easy to talk about God and love for God, but uh, it's like that bumper sticker. 
It says, uh, if you love Jesus, honk. Any of you remember that one? Yeah, you got to be careful because it might be a lady that's a Christian with a bumper sticker and then her husband's got the car and he's not. And you come up behind and go doot doot and smile and he may not be happy. <laughs> <laughs> but I saw another bumper sticker. It said, um, if you love Jesus, tithe. Anyone can honk. If you love Jesus, tithe. Anybody can honk. And so there's a lot of honking Christianity out there. But if you really love the Lord, it's not just your faith, it's your works. You show your love. Amen. All right, Pastor Doug, I think we got our final question for this afternoon. Who is Melchizedek? Melchizedek the king. You find him mentioned in the book of Genesis when Abraham is coming back from this battle. Uh, Lot was captured by these five kings north of Israel. And uh, Abraham rallied all of his soldiers, he had like 300 I think and 18 soldiers among his, his clan and then he got together with two other sheiks in the country and they went and they attacked these uh, Chedorlaomer and his kings. They totally routed them. They rescued Lot and all the people who had been captured from Sodom and Gomorrah. You know God saved the people in Sodom and Gomorrah before he destroyed them. And uh, on his way back to Hebron all the bounty of war really belonged to Abraham because he led the whole battle. And it says he stopped in a place called Salem, which was later known as Jerusalem, or Shalom, means peace. And there was a king there whose name was Melchizedek. Now he's referred to several times in the book of Hebrews as a type of Christ. He was a real person. It says like Christ, there's no genealogy. In other words, no beginning or end. We don't know where he came from or it doesn't tell what happened to him afterward. He suddenly appears and disappears. So Paul says he's almost like everlasting to everlasting and that he doesn't have beginning and end. It says Melchizedek when Abraham came he brought forth bread and wine. That's a symbol for like the New Testament. Jesus has the bread and he's got the grape juice. And the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And he was a king over a place called Salem which means peace. And so here's this Melchizedek. He's a type of Christ. He's king of righteousness, king of peace. He's a high priest. And Abraham pays tithe to him. The big question is who is he? He's somewhat of a mystery. It doesn't say what people he was from. I've heard uh, some speculate and I think there's some ancient uh, Jewish writings that say Melchizedek was Shem. I can't prove that but it is true Shem, the son of Adam, was still alive and very old during that time and the theory is that as they went further and further into paganism in Ur of the Chaldees that Shem had heard that God had called Abram to worship Jehovah in the land of Canaan and he and his family came and settled in Salem. And the only person who would be greater than Abraham that would be called a priest of the Most High God is someone who worshiped the same God. And so uh, that's one solution I've heard for the mystery of who was Melchizedek. It's a very interesting theory. Can't prove it one way or the other. But um, he was a type of Christ. All right. Well, thank you again for all of your questions that's come in. We're out of time for Bible questions, Pastor Doug, but uh, we're not done just yet. I'd like to invite Tony to come up. And uh, those of you who came in, hopefully you all just registered by writing down your name. We have a Bible we would like to give away at this time. It is an Amazing Facts Study Bible. So uh, we're going to dig around in here and see if we can find a card. And Tony, you're going to tell us whose name is on the card there. Kevin Grinder? Grind? Kevin. Is there a Kevin? There he is. Come on up, Kevin. Come on up, Kevin. We got the Bible for you here. This is an Amazing Facts Study Bible. We hope it will be a a rich blessing for you. We got all the study guides actually in the back of the Bible. So we want to give that to you as well. Thank you very much. Absolutely welcome. We also want to remind you that we do have a gift that we'll be giving you. Maybe you received it last night if you just came this afternoon and you weren't here last night. It's a book entitled Who Do You Think You Are? And we'll have that available in the foyer as you leave this afternoon. And we'll be happy to give that to you. Uh, at this time, we're going to be taking a 10-minute break, and then we'll continue with our 3 o'clock, our final presentation. We are so grateful that we have Henderson here, and he's going to be playing for us on the piano. So don't go too far. Be sure to be here before 3 o'clock for our final presentation. And again, we want to invite you to make your way to the front, fill up these front seats. We appreciate those of you in the middle, and um, we'll continue with our program. God bless you.
You know, friends, one of the fastest growing forms of crime out there right now is identity theft. That's where these unscrupulous people will capture a person's social security number, their driver's license number, personal information, and with that, they're able to take over their bank account, loot all of their assets, and sometimes just take over their lives. Well, you know, the devil is a master of identity theft. And this is so important to understand because Jesus said it's crucial that we have faith to be saved. Without faith, you can't please God. The just will live by faith. And the devil has been stealing the identity of God's people for 6,000 years. Well, that's why I wrote this recent book called, Who Do You Think You Are? We think it's so important for people to understand who they are in Christ, how to have saving faith and peace, knowing that you belong to God. If you'd like a free copy, we'll send it to you. All you have to do is contact the number on your screen and then promise when you read it, you'll share it with someone else.